so today we're, we're, as James mentioned, we're going to talk about Apex plugins and it's a very basic 101 webinar and talk. And today's agenda, we're just going to go over the goals of what the presentation is about. We're going to cover some of the background and history for plugins, then go on to the demo. The real focus of this webinar is, is on the demo and then answer any questions. Now this presentation is about 30 to 40 minutes long with the demo and we really encourage you to, to ask a lot of questions. I'll stick around as long as possible to answer all the questions. So please ask any questions. Though this is a 101 type talk, I'm open to questions on, on anything regarding plugins. So some of the, the goals is, as I mentioned, it's an introductory webinar. I, I want people to get a basic understanding of the plugin architecture and at the end of it, the ability to use a basic plugin and that's a basic or to build a basic plugin and really want you to have an understanding of the fundamentals. So a little bit of, about the history of plugins and this is, this is really important to understand where plugins, what happened before plugins were invented <clears throat> and how that really dr drives how plugins are currently being used. And so before, before there were plugins, people had to write a lot of JavaScript, which they still have to do, but in a more, in a more structured way now. But they, they had to write a lot of JavaScript, import CSS file, images, and it could get, things could get very messy very quickly. And if you, if you want great examples of this, go on to just about any Apex blog and look at all the pre-Apex 4 posts. And a lot of them have to do on how to add custom tweaks to regions or to items to make them look cooler, etc. And at the time, a lot of Apex got a bit of a bad rap because people were saying, well, it, it doesn't do all these other features that other web programming frameworks allowed it to do, whereas you had to do all these custom workarounds. Well, now with, with Apex 4, they introduced plugins which allow you, the Apex developer, to create your own widgets and your, your own Apex objects, really. And what I mean, Apex can't be expected, the Oracle Apex team can't be expected to to write every sort of type of object that you would need on a web platform. And this is really why they opened up the plugin architecture. And the other great thing about plugins is it allows you to share your plugins within the community. And that's a big thing. So if you create something that has a ranking system, let's just say a, a 10 star ranking system, and you think it's a great plugin, you can share it with the community for others to use. And that can cut down a lot of development time for everyone else, as well as within your organization, you can share those plugins so that everyone can use them. It's standardized and it's quick and easy to use. So what are the different types of plugins? Starting in with Apex 4.1, two new plugins were added, and those are, those are suffixed here with stars. And they're the authentication and authorization plugins. And then the original plugins from Apex 4 are dynamic action, item type plugin, and we're going to do a demo on an item type plugin, process, and region. The, probably the two most popular plugins that people develop, tend to develop are dynamic action and item type plugin. The item type plugin I personally find is one of the easiest plugins to start with and once you get a good understanding of that then you can move on to other types of plugins as you develop them and, and it will all make sense. If you go right away to dynamic actions it might be a bit confusing. There's a, a couple extra moving parts that you have to understand whereas the item one I, I as I said, it's probably the easiest one. It's one I started on when I built my first plugin. And since we're going to cover the item type plugin today, I'm just going to describe a bit of things that you should be aware of with the item type plugin. So with each plugin, there's something called callback functions. 
And what callback functions do is essentially they generate the content that the user will see or the code or, or some of the processing code that you'll need as part of your plugin. And this, this is really the magic behind everything. This is what makes it all work. And with item type plugins, there are three callback functions. And before I continue, I just want to say if this is sounding a bit confusing, if you're new to plugins, please just remember this slide and it will start making a lot more sense when we see the demos. But it's important that you just have a, a basic understanding of this. The first plugin or the first callback function is called a render function. And what this does is it generates all the HTML for the item. And when I'm saying it does this, it allows you as the plugin developer to do this. So in your render function, you're going to actually have HTTP.p calls and print out input elements and some extra CSS information or even JavaScript code. You have complete control of it and this is where you do it from. The next callback function is the AJAX function. And what AJAX allows you to do is make asynchronous calls from the browser to the web server without having to submit the, the page. It's a bit more extra complexity. And because this is a beginner's webinar, we're not going to talk about it. However, if you do have questions, we can answer them towards the end. And the last callback function is for validations. And this is a really cool feature that Apex has now. And what it allows you to do is if you develop a, a plugin, an item type plugin, you can add additional validation so that other Apex developers don't have to do it. For, for example, if you have a plugin that rates a star rating system from 1 to 10, you know that the values are 1 through 10. If it's less than 1, it's not allowed. If it's greater than 10, it's not allowed. And in the past, what you'd have to do is someone would use your code and then they'd have to write a custom validation for every instantiation of that item type. Now with validations, they can just enable validation on the item when it's submit. And then you can say, this item we know has to have a range from 1 to 10. And it just cuts down on the overall development time. So it's a really great feature. And I strongly recommend that you use it on your item type plugins. So now onto the demo. And what today's the demo we're doing today is a very simple demo. And what, what I'd like to do is make a credit card selection item type. And currently what, what I see on a lot of websites are something similar to this where you select the credit card from a drop-down list. But wouldn't it be nicer if you could select it from some images? And that's, that's what we're going to do. So instead of having a, a very old, quote-unquote, old-fashioned select list, we're going to have some images to select from. And before we continue developing the plugin, I strongly recommend to list your requirements for the plugin that you want, for things that you want to develop. Now requirements in general for programming is a good practice. We all know we should do it. I think with plugins, it's something that we should just spend the time and we don't have to have a very formal process, but just list out at a high level what you want to do. And the reason why I'm emphasizing this is when I created my first plugin, I said, I, just in my head, I'm going to do two or three things. And when I got in, into the, the real meat of the plugin and started programming it, I, I started thinking, well, I could add in this extra feature and this extra widget. And that three or four things became 10 or 11 things really quickly, on top of which it started to get confusing because I was new to the whole plugin architecture, learning it. And the whole plugin just crashed right off the bat. It, it just didn't get to work. And what I had to do was completely scrap that plugin, take a piece of paper, and write down saying, these are the three things I need this plugin to do. And as soon as I did that, it made a huge difference. I was able to easily write the plugin because I kept to those three things. And then after I got them working, I was able to expand the plugin. So it's, it's just something, please take the time, write it on a scrap piece of paper and then follow those and make sure you stick to those requirements and then add extra additional functionality once you get it to work. And for this plugin, 
there's four requirements. And the first one is to be able to select a credit card based on the image. The credit card should be grayed out until they're selected. You're only allowed selecting one credit card at a time, and that really makes sense. You usually don't pay with two credit cards. And we want to restrict it to three popular credit cards, Visa, American Express, and MasterCard. It's pretty simple requirements. Now the next thing before actually developing the plugin is to build a proof of concept. And the reason why I'm stating this is a plugin, you have to write your own HTML code, your own JavaScript code, some of your own CSS. And if you're trying to do this while working within the plugin architecture, it can be a bit confusing and also extra timely to actually get it all working. And so what I've actually done, and I do this for all my plugins, is build a simple proof of concept in an HTML file and maybe a JavaScript file to test out and to make sure it works. So I'm going to actually show you what my proof of concept looks like. And here you can see it's, it's nothing fancy. I've got some hello text here. I've, I've left it exactly as I normally would. I've got some, some extra JavaScript code lying around. But you're going to see that as I click each credit card, it lights up. The colors change and the other credit cards gray out. And it took me a little while to get that working, to get all the JavaScript working properly, to get the image size correctly. And I was able to do it in a simple HTML file, which is here. Should load up now. And we won't go, won't go into it, but just to prove that I spent some time and wrote a very, very basic example. And that's critical when doing plugins, I think, spending that extra time and writing out the proof of concept. So we're going to go on to our demo now. And I have the big explanation mark there to just as a, a little bit of a warning that since this is an introductory webinar, the code example that I'm using is really meant to keep things as basic as possible. I didn't add in extra security features, a lot of debugging and instrumentation, a couple other standards that I normally apply simply because that would expand the code, the code and you might get more confused than you need to be. What I, I, so what I want, I, I don't want people to do is to take these plugin, this plugin and put it in their production code as is and said, well, Martin, Martin gave a webinar on this. We can use it as is. No, please do not. This is simply for an example to get understanding. If you want to, if you want to get a, a good example of how to make professional and, and production level plugins, I strongly suggest checking out one of the community sites, apexplugin.com, and I'll post that link at the end. And there, there's some great examples on how to develop production level plugins. So now onto our demo. Just waiting for the page to load up. So you should be able to see, I've got a, a simple screen here. Let me just try and zoom in a bit. And what it is, is I've already pre-built something that has a simple region. It's got a submit button, a clear button. So it's just, it's ready to take some input data. And I've got, I'm going to work on two different tabs. One's going to be for the plugin and one is going to be for the page items. So the first thing to do is to click on shared components and we're just going to create the plugin. Go to plugins. Let me try and blow things up, zoom things in here a bit. And I'm going to cr click the create button. And every plugin, you've got to type in a name. So in, in this case, the name will be credit card selector. Very simple. The next thing to do is an internal name. Now, what an internal name is, it's essentially a unique key for the plugin. And the, the standard that people have been using and that's recommended from Oracle is to use the reverse DNS of your organization and then suffix that with the plugin name. So in this case, I'm going to use com.clarifit.apexplugin.creditcard. 
and you can choose whatever you want, but that it, you have to make sure it's a unique identifier. And I'm just going to, after this, I'm going to click, click, click the Create button. And we've essentially created our plugin. Now let's, let's see what actually happens. Does, does it work? We're not 100% sure, but that's the, the fundamental of just creating a plugin. So let's go to the page item or the page edit screen. And I'm going to add a new page item. So it's a standard page item selection tool. I click or selection wizard. I click plugins. And you can now see I've got the credit card selector. So I select that. And I just enter in the item name. You, you've, probably, you've seen this a million times before. Click next. And I'm just going to create the item. So this is all standard. You, you should have done this in the past many times creating items. And I'm going to go to our run page and refresh it just to see what happens. And when I refresh it, I get this error saying that no render function has been defined for the plugin. And this makes sense because we really, if you think about it, we haven't done anything and Apex isn't magic, so it's not going to randomly work for us. So we've got to add some additional things. So let's go back to the plugin edit page and we, let's modify a couple things first before we continue. Actually, we're just going to go and edit the credit card for one second. Make sure. Oh. Okay, so we're back to editing the plugin. And we're going to go down to the settings section. And the first thing I'm going to change is this file prefix. And what, it, what a file prefix allows you to do is state where external files for this plugin are going to be accessible from. And it's similar to the app images substitution string, but this is for plugin specific. Now there's two real main locations that you'd store external files. One is embedded directly in the plugin, and the other one is stored on a web server. When you're developing a plugin, highly recommended that you work on a, on a local copy of JavaScript files or CSS files simply because you can modify them quickly and easily rather than embedding them directly in the plugin. So I'm just going to change this to my local host. And I've got a directory on there called Redgate. And inside there I put in all my JavaScript and images files. And it allows me to quickly modify my changes. The next thing I'm going to scroll down to is the standard attributes. And this can be this section can be a, a bit confusing sometimes because well, what effect do standard attributes really have? So if we go back to the edit page item, and I'm going to zoom out here a bit, you should see that there's only, there's not a lot of options to choose from. There's five different sections, which is not what we normally have. That's what standard attributes deter allows you to do. It determines what what options are available on the item screen. So I'm just going to select some of them and for full information click on the attributes label and a help item pops up and it will display it will display it will give you some information about what each standard attribute means. So I've clicked a couple of them. I'm going to apply my changes. I'm going to go back to the edit page and I'm going to refresh it. And you'll notice now that there's a whole bunch more options. We have the label thing here, so I'm just going to fill that in with credit card. We're, we have templates, required with help, value required. So you can see there's a whole set of new options available simply because we checked off some of the standard attributes. And you should be familiar with most of what these standard attributes are. So if I'm going to rerun the, the plugin page just to see what 
or the, the run page just to see if anything really changed. And I, I refreshed it and we get the exact same error. Again, this makes sense because we haven't actually told Apex what to show for that item type plugin. And this is where the callback functions come in. And if you remember that slide I showed you on, the, the three callback functions for an item type are render, Ajax, and validation. And render function really allows you to display what the end users will see. So the, the first question I had when developing was, well, what do we put in the render function name? I don't even know what it looks like. And it's really, they've done a great job on this because all you have to do is click on the label and some help pops up. I'll wait for that to show up. And in the help screen, they actually give you the function header. So this is really helpful. So I'm going to copy this, the function header. And if you scroll down, there's function headers for region type plugins and dynamic type plugins. So we've copied that. I'm going to close it and I'm going to open my SQL developer and I'm going to paste it into a package. Now this, this brings up a, another point of you can embed not only external files in a plugin, you can also embed your PL SQL code in a plugin. Again, another best practice is to actually develop your code in a, in a package first and then if you want to embed it, you can move it easily into the plugin after. It's a lot easier for debugging and, and just modifications in, in your favorite IDE rather than in a text area in Apex. So I'm just going to rename the function to fRenderCreditCard. And it's pretty much all there is to it. I compile it. And now you see that there's a whole bunch of objects here. You have an Apex plugin T page item, Apex plugin dot T plugin. Not pretty sure what those types mean. The easiest way to find them is to go onto the documentation. And if you're on the documentation page online, wait for that to show up. At the bottom, there's something called API reference. And if you click the HTML file, it will open a new window. And on the left hand side, click on the Apex plugin link. And there you have all the different data, data types and what they mean. So if you click on T page item, you can see all the, all the attributes in that object. And that makes it really easy to use. So now you can, you can find out all the information, what all those variables mean. So now that we've, we've defined our package spec, we also have to define the package body. So I'm going to go there. And I've already, I've already pasted, or done some code here so that you don't have to sit and watch me type. And it essentially just looks exactly like the spec. I've created this return variable and I'm just returning it. So I'm not really doing much, but I'm just making sure it compiles. So now if I go back to run the application and I refresh the page, nothing happened. And that's because I, this is by mistake, I forgot to add in the render function name. So I've compiled some code, but now I also have to register that code with the, the plugin itself. So there's, in the render function, uh, render function field, I just call my package redgate.frendercreditcard, and I'll apply my changes. And now that registers the the function name that we have with Apex. So it says, when you're, when you're going to display the credit card item, use this procedure or this function. So if I go back to the run page and run it, you're going to see that the credit card label appears, which is good, and nothing else shows up. And 
again, that's expected because we didn't do anything. So we, we've made progress on our plugin. It's no longer crashing. We've created a render function, but now we actually want to display those images and create the item type. So what I'm going to do is we're going to go back to the package body and I'm going to copy, I'm going to paste in some code just to get this plugin working. And we're going to walk through some of that code. Okay, so let's go to the top here. So I've I hope you can all see it. If if it's too small, please please type a message in the in the chat window, and I'll I'll try and expand it. But it's pr it should be pretty big right now. The so the what I want to what I want to show is right off the start. There's some debug code, and what the debug code is. If you put this in place, and it's recommended that you do this in all your plugins, if you have an issue or when the application is running, running in debug mode, it will automatically print out in the debug screen all the information about the item plugin. So instead of writing your own custom debugging code, just include this in, at the top of every single plugin and you'll be, you'll be fine. Obviously change it. This is debugging for an item type. Change it for each type of plugin that you use. The next part is if, how to handle read-only and printer-friendly mode. I won't go into this too much, but essentially all it says is just display the value, don't display anything else. And that's pretty simple. And then in this else block, this is where the real meat of the plugin starts. And it says, this is what's going to display it to the end user. And so if we go on to line 49 here, and if we look at it, it says, add this JavaScript library. And what this allows us to do is, is we go and it says load up a JavaScript so I don't have to write my script tags or anything and just say, I have a JavaScript file that this plugin uses, load it up. And you'll notice that it uses something here called pplugin file prefix. If you, if you remember, I'm just going to go back to the edit plugin, that file prefix is is the same thing as this here. It references from my local web server. And so that helps a lot because you don't even have to hard code where this file is. You can include a version number. And the last thing that's not included as an attribute on this, and there's a reason why because it has a good default value, is something called a key, the P key attribute or variable. And what the key does is it says only load this if, the, if this file has already been loaded with the same key, don't load it again. And so that saves a lot of time so you don't have to make, you don't have to make extra Javis or extra web requests or you don't have to run the same file or information over again. So Apex is really smart like that. So if you had, the easiest way to imagine this is if you had five instantiations of this credit card selector on the same page, it will only load the credit card file once for the credit card JavaScript file. And then after that, it won't need to load it again because it sees it's already loaded. And here we can, if the same concept is on this on load code. Here I wrote some custom JavaScript code. It's not a file anymore. And actually, so it's, it, it runs all the time. Sorry, let me restart that. This is, a, this is some custom JavaScript code. And what I want it to do is I want it to run all the time. And that's because I put some custom information that's specific to this input item. Another technique you might notice is on these lines is I'm just writing some simple HTML or JavaScript and then I'm replacing them, the, the mnemonics with some variables. You don't have to do this, but this is a really great practice since when you get some more complicated code, it makes it easier to read. And John, I have to thank John Scott from the Apex Evangelist for showing me this. It's a really great tool. Yes, it does add a couple extra calls, but when you write out a lot of plugins, you're going to see how it simplifies things. And I'll show you another example below. So the next step is writing some CSS. Here's another example of 
some HTML. And if we if you look at it, if you have to concatenate all those different values in there, this string would look very complex and hard to read. Whereas if I just use mnemonics and replace them after, it makes it pretty easy. And to scroll down. So, so right at the end, that, that just displays the, the different credit cards. And then this is a key line here. This is actually going to display that input element, and this is what stores the value. Again, I replace it with some of the, the variables and then print it out to the screen. So I'm going to run the page now. And now I've, I've really taken control and, and done what Apex does, but I'm actually doing it in my plugin. So I go back to the run play page and I run it. You should see all three credit cards and the inputs Input, uh, input text field. So if I click each credit card, you're going to see it changes color and it changes the value in the input field. Now we don't want to display this input field to users, so I'm just going to go back to the to the code and just type it as hidden. I'm going to recompile it. I'm going to rerun the page, and there we go. We've got our, our final plugin. It looks, it works. I can click on each credit card. So just to drive home the point, I'm going to select MasterCard here, and I'm going to click the Submit button, and you're going to see that the page reloaded and MasterCard is already selected. Just to drive home the point, if I look in Session, you can see that the MasterCard value was, is stored as P1 credit card. So the last thing I want to show you is the validation function. And just for time purposes, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Just to test it out, I'm going to change that hidden input field to text again. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the callback functions. And I'm going to get the validation header code. So I click on the validation function name. And I scroll down to the item type header information. I copy it. And I'm just going to paste it into SQL Developer now. So if we go back into our spec. You can see it's similar to the render function, but it essentially doesn't have the read-only and printer-friendly values because you, you don't need it. And now I'm just going to put it in, I'm going to write the, the package body information. And I'll, I'll show it to you really quickly. And here you can see that it's a pretty simple function. And what it does is it says, if the value is not null, and if the value is not in our predefined set of credit cards of Visa, American Express, and MasterCard, then display an invalid message because something bad happened. If I click OK, I already compile it. So now I'm going to go back to the render page. Oh, there's one last thing I have to do in the validation. I actually have to register that function with the plugin. So I said package redgate.f validate credit card. Click apply changes. If I go back to the run page, remember we, we unhid that input element. I'm going to change it the value to RBC. And RBC is not a valid input. We only want Visa, MasterCard, and American, and American Express. So if I click Submit now, notice how I didn't add in any extra validations as an Apex developer. Automatically at the top of the page, I got some information saying that this is an invalid credit card type. So you can start seeing how this saves time for the Apex developers. If you put in as much business logic as you can possibly do on the plugin, 
and add those extra validations, you're cutting down overall development time within for Apex developers. Now, if you use this plugin over and over and over again, this can save you and your organization a lot of time. So I'm just going to go back to the presentation now. And there are some things to think of before or while you're program while you're writing plugins. And a couple things, and I, I've I touched on them briefly, but if you if you have if your plugin is going to be used multiple times on a page, you should handle that appropriately. So you don't, for instance, you don't want that JavaScript file loading over and over and over again. You only want it loading once. Another thing is error handling. You really have to determine what I call soft and hard errors. Do you want the whole application to crash if something happens, or can the user continue? For instance, when we're displaying an item plugin, if we ha encounter an error while, display while rendering that code, we should probably crash the application and raise an application error because we can't guarantee the state of the application. Or in some cases, for AJAX functions, for instance, you might want to display a soft error. So there's different techniques you can go and we, again, we might, I might do another webinar with, with more advanced plugin building and discuss some of this. Some of the security to make sure there's no cross-site scripting or PLSQL injection. The ability to handle read and print only mode. I touched on it in the demo and there's, there's more things you can do depending on what your requirement is. And the last thing is instrumentation and that's very, very important. Putting in a lot of debugging statements in your plugin will help you down the road. And there's two good, besides the standard reasons of why you want to debug, debug your or put instrumentation within your code, the, the two good reasons are, A, if you put it in the, in the community, it makes it really easy for other people to send you back screenshots of, of the plugin saying, hey, I was using this in my application, this is the output, do you know what happened? And when you have all that instrumentation and those log messages, you, it allows you to debug it quickly. And the other thing is internally, you might not have access to the code that someone else is running in a different department or an end user is. Mm -hmm. And if you instrument it properly, you can obtain logs within your own Apex applications that, that will display really what's going on. You can see, hey, that attribute should be uppercase instead of lowercase. So just some links. To, to follow. The first one is apex-plugin.com and that's where a lot of developers have been posting both free and commercially available plugins online. You can check them out. There, there's some great plugins, some great examples, and, it, and there's plugin types for I think all of them. I'm not sure if authentication and authorization plugins have been added yet, but you can, you can definitely get some good ideas from them and learn from them as well. Apexblogs.info, the site that's run by the Apex Evangelist, also contains some plugin information. I think they have a plugin section on the top right corner of their page. And, and that's an RSS aggregator with all the Apex blog information. So everyone that writes an Apex blog, their information gets posted on that site. And the last one is we run a, a demo site called plugins.clarifit.com. And there we, we highlight some of our plugin demos along with the blog post and information regarding them. And please check out that site over the next month. We're going to be posting some additional plugins. So now that's pretty much it. And I'm open to answering questions. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I'm sure everybody will agree that it was, it was a, a great presentation. Uh, pitch just at the right level, particularly uh, for somebody like myself. I'm very new to, to Apex. I'm certainly very new to plugins. Uh, so we've got, we've got a few questions already in the chat box. So Great. I'm going to ask these to Martin now. If you have jotted down any notes or you would like to ask Martin a question about Apex plugins, uh, please, if you could just type that into the question box on your console. I'll be able to answer your questions, or rather, I'll be able to put your questions to Martin, uh, and Martin can answer them. Okay, so the first question is from uh, Josep Kos. Uh, thank you, Josep. And it's, could you please give us five cents on how Ajax callback works? I can't imagine how you can handle different Ajax calls 
with one simple callback? That is an excellent question. And I think a lot of people have that. I have that when I first started. So I, I'll, maybe I'll take a step, back, a couple steps back and make sure everyone understands what AJAX is again and then answer your question directly. So AJAX, what it does is allows the client browser to send an asynchronous call to the server and get a response back and without submitting the page. So you've probably seen that in Apex before where you have cascading select lists. So for instance, if you select a country as Canada, then automatically the provinces will get refreshed. If you select the country as United States, the whole list of states get refreshed. And so, so it's that sort of concept that Ajax drives that without having to submit the page. So it really allows users quick interaction. Now with plugins, you have that one Ajax render function. And so uh, Joseph's question is, how do you handle if you have to do multiple things for any particular reason? Well, in the Ajax function, you're allowed up to 10 attributes to be passed in from the JavaScript side to the server. And this, again, this is, I'm generalizing this. And those attributes are labeled X01 through X010. And what you can do is if you want to have, if, you, if your Ajax function has to support multiple features, is you can use the first variable almost as a function name. And so I'm just going to load up the SQL developer here, and I'm going to simulate this, that essentially we can just do that if x01, and this is not the full value name, is equal to my function a, then you're going to do something, right? We're going to do x. Else, if it's x01, is equal to my function b, then we're going to do something else called y. And you get the understanding that you can get around that issue, so that though it only allows one render function or that says this is how to call the server, on the server side you can actually handle multiple Ajax calls. So I hope that answers your question. If, if you want to follow up, by all means, please type it in the box and I'll, I'll answer it at the end. Thanks, Martin. Uh, the next question is again from Josep, uh, and this is, can you parameterize validation messages? I.e., can you disable them to let a user skip them? Okay, so the question is, can you, can you disable or enable the validation that we have in place? And we can actually go through and, and do that right now. And what the answer is yes, but it's the Apex developer that controls it. So the goal of the plugin is you provide as much as possible to the developer or the person using the plugin, and the person using the plugin turns on or off certain features. So if we go back to the, the, the edit page, I'm just seeing where this is. Acquired credit card. Oh, I think it's on the submit. Sorry, I'm just looking for where this is. Okay, I, I can't find it right now, but there is an, an option that says, oh, I believe it might be here even. Okay, so on the submit button, apologize for all that clicking around, there's something that, that says execute validations. And that allows people to say that, or it allows the Apex developers to say that if you submit the page, do you want the automat, do you want the validations associated with the plugins run and the page plugins? So that somewhat answers your question because if I disable it, the validation that we added won't get run. But how do you parameterize it? Well, in, if you wanted to tweak it even more, there are attributes or custom attributes for each plugin that you can do. And so from there, you could say for this item, I don't ever want it to be validated. So you can do it both on the global scale for the entire page and on an each individual 
plugin or item plugin level one, but you have to program that in. So you, you, your validation function still might run, but in your validation function, you'd have to state saying that if this attribute is set to disable, don't run anything else, exit the validation and consider it passed. James, the next question, please. Thanks, Martin. So the next question is from Jose Murillo, and it's, are there many major changes in the Apex plugin architecture from 4.0 to 4.1? So there, there are some. I think the two biggest ones are the new type of plugins that you're going to see, the off or that you can see now, the authentication and authorization. One of the other big features that people were asking for is before you were only allowed up to 10 attributes, both custom and global, and now you're allowed up to 15 custom and global attributes. So it gives you a little bit more room to pass in parameters from the development screen back to the plugin. There, there probably are some other small tweaks, but those are, I think, some of the biggest ones you're going to see. Great, thanks Martin. The next question is from Ravi Jain. Uh, thank you Ravi. Is there an easy way to add ext.js to Apex? I wonder whether Matt Nolan is, is, has joined us today. Yeah, I, I was just about to say that. Matt Nolan is the guy to ask for that. He's got a, I'll just load up his website right here. Apex free Let me just, so there's someone called Matt Nolan. He's, he develops a lot of great Apex plugins. Oh, it's got some music. I'm just gonna close this page so we don't hear it. But he's got a website called theapexfreelancer.com and he's got a blog on there as well. And he specializes a lot in ext.js within Apex. So the answer is yes, I'm not the expert, but definitely check out his website and and his blog, and you can probably contact him with any specific questions that you may have. James? Okay, thanks, Martin. So, so some good questions uh, from the audience so far. Uh, I'm just wondering whether a few people are, are still typing some questions in. Uh, so if you do have a question, that you want to put to Martin regarding uh, Apex plugin development, uh, you could just type that in your, your chat box now, please. And, and please, I'm open to as, as basic and or as complex questions. Odds are if you've got that question, someone else will probably have the same question as, as well. So we might as, now's a great time to ask and everyone can help learn from it. Okay, so a question in from Peter Raganich. Hi, Peter. Uh, what are the limits of plugins in Apex? Where is the border where writing a plugin doesn't make sense anymore? That's, Peter, that is an excellent question. You somewhat stumped me on this one. I, I think a lot of people have, have the question of, well, let me, let me re-ask that question, and the question is, what's the limitations of Apex in general? And really, Apex is a framework that whatever you can do on the web, you can do in Apex. Because of that, I don't really see any hard limitations, and I'm sure there are some that are very few and far between, but I, I generally don't see any hard, like final limitations says, no, you can't do that because it's Apex and it's a plugin. We've seen plugins that integrate with Twitter, with Google Maps, some very complex JavaScript using jQuery, jQuery UI. Matt Nolan has done some great plugins using the ext.js things. So we've seen it work both with other Apex components and with third-party web applications. You could even do web services if you want, RSS feeders. So I, I really haven't hit that limit yet. And I know, Peter, you've even done some HTML5 plugin that you've posted online. So there's, there's definitely no limitations that I know of yet. The only thing I could think of 
is if you had something that had required more than 15 attributes because of the current limitations in place, those are, I haven't, personally I haven't come across a plugin with more than 15 attributes, but I know some people have started crossing that barrier, and that's maybe summarized, maybe you have to make better default assumptions at that point. But overall, I, I don't see any real showstoppers. Thanks, Martin. Uh, thanks, Peter. Next question is from uh, Walter Verkill. I uh, hope I pronounced that okay. And it's, I saw the image change from no color to, into a color. Uh, where did you program it? Okay. So I, that's a great question, and you probably should have shown that a bit closer. I'm going to go back to my code. And in the PL SQL part, I said add some JavaScript in there. And that's calling some a file called credit card.js essentially that I programmed. And after that I said run this function in that thing called credit card setup. And I'll show you what that procedure looks like. So this is this is what the file looks like. And it, it, it just says make all the other credit cards gray and then make this one colorful, the one that was selected. And to drive home the, the point, I have a web server that's running and this is the Redgate folder and there is the credit card.js file and these are some images that I needed for that for the for the plugin to work. So that's that's how it all ties into place. I have the, the web server where this is stored, the this is what the contents of that JavaScript file are. They're very, very simple. And then in the plugin itself, I've actually explicitly called it and said load that JavaScript file and then load run that function. James? Okay, thanks, Martin. Uh, so next question is uh, another one from Ravi. Thanks, Ravi. Is there a plugin to link Oracle R12 security in Apex 4.1. Uh, and the reason he's asking is he needs help to enhance Oracle EBS uh, using Apex. I, Ravi, I, I can't answer that with a surety. Someone may have written one. I haven't personally seen one right now. Because Apex now has two additional type of, sorry, they, because Apex now has two new plugin types, both authorization and authentication. You may start seeing people start writing them. It's, it's a possibility if you're running Apex 4.1, but you may have to also develop that yourself. Okay, thanks, Martin. Uh, next question from Torsef Sheik. Can I develop plug plugins that include web services reference? Uh, if I was that on with EVS, what type of web services for example, A, SOAP, B, REST. So the question is, can you write, I think we'd have to even take a step back and say, can we write plugins that integrate with other websites in general? And yes, yes you can. I've got a new plugin coming out pretty soon that's a very simple RSS reader that goes and fetches content from an RSS atom feed. Now as for specific web services, absolutely. So essentially what you do is in your, let's say we're, we're going to do that in our render function, instead of calling all this code, what you could do is call a web service, and I'll show you where you can get some of that code already. Apex bundles that all together, or has packages to handle all that. So instead of writing this set of code, what you write is code to access your web service that goes and fetches information and then display it back. So all that you're acting here is you're acting as the middleman in a plugin when you're rendering things. You're taking in some information, you're tweaking it, modifying it, and then printing it out to the user how they expect it to. So if we go into the APIs, there's an API called Apex Web Service. And that's at the bottom of the page, the link. And here you can see how to make REST, RESTful web services. I'm not 100% sure about SOAP, but if you wanted to, I'm sure you could program your own. 
James? Thanks, Martin. So we've got a question here from Debbie Baliotti. Uh, hi, Debbie. Uh, she said she's, she's a real newbie, but her shop doesn't allow direct access to the web service, so we store images in the database. You mentioned storing these plugins on the web server. Will we need to open up access to our web server to implement the plugins? Short answer is no. So because, and you're, Debbie, you're not alone. A lot of people have told me that they don't have access to their, their web server, their corporate web server to modify images. So what I recommend, and this is going to answer more than what you're asking, is when you're developing, install a local web service on, on your computer. And it's the one I recommend is the Apache web server. And it's, it's free, open source, so there's no licensing fees. And you don't have to really worry about security if, as long as you're running it internal. And what you can do is, in the plugin that I had, if you've noticed, where is it? In the settings, I'm referencing my local web server. And in there, you can work on the file. So you modify the file, you tweak the file, you do whatever you want with your JavaScript, your CSS, and your images. And just to drive home the point, you can see that those files are actually stored here on my local computer in the www redgate folder. And I just created that for my web server. So when you're developing, you don't have to go contact your system administrator and say, hey, I, I need to modify this file or can you upload this? Because it will take you a lot of time to probably do that. So developing it on your local machine. Then at the end, once everything works, what you can do is change the file prefix and change it to this thing called plugin prefix. And what that does is says use the embedded version of the file. If you scroll down the page to the files section, what you can do is actually start uploading those files into the, into the system. And so if you upload the file, you, you apply your changes, you don't need to change any of your PL SQL code. When Apex renders a page, it will actually grab that image from Apex itself. And so what that means is anything that, all the images that Apex can already load, it will just load up your custom file directly from, the, from your Apex server rather than from your local host. And so that way you don't have to go after system administrators to get any sort of extra access. Great, thanks Martin. Uh, before I move on to the next question, uh, Ronald Marks has just typed something into the, the question box. I'm not sure if you can see it, Martin. Uh, but Ronald believes that he's seen a white paper on integrating EBX and APEX inclusive, inclusive of security. So he's going to email, email that across to you. Uh, and Ravi, okay. we, Ravi, we can forward that on to you. So Ravi, if, uh, I'm just going to post up my email address right now. If you can send me an email, if, if both the person that has the white paper and Ravi send me the email, I'll put you two in contact with one another. Great, thanks Martin. Okay, uh, uh, Josep has uh, another question and it's if you want to export a plugin, how do you deploy it if you have external files such as JS or internal as the package you created? Do you have to embed them to, do you have to, sorry, start again, do you have to embed them to the code or must provide user instructions? So Yosef's questions, the answer, the answer to Yosef is it depends. And the reason why it depends is it depends on where the plugin is going. If the plugin is internal within your organization, odds are you, you may not need to bundle the PL SQL code because assuming all your applications have access to the same packages, you don't need to do it. And it's actually a perform it, it's faster to actually do that in the long run. But if you are sending it out either to the community or just to another department within your organization that doesn't have access to the same database or doesn't use the same packages, then what you do need to do is copy the code and move it into your, your plugin. And so I'll show you a quick example on how to do that. What we'd essentially do is if I go back into, our, into the SQL developer, 
just to show you, I take the the render function. I'm gonna, it's pretty long, and I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to go into the plugin and modify it. And if I click on the source, there's this PL SQL source field here. There, I just paste in the function. Notice I took out all the package header; it's just the function name, and in the callback section, instead of referencing my package, I reference just this function. And what it will do is actually, I'm going to click Apply Changes. And now, if I, I'm just going to run the page just to show you that this works. Oh, the images aren't loading up because I changed the file prefix. But you can see that the plugins, besides the images not working, the plugin still renders. And instead of referencing my package, it's actually referencing this inline source code in here. Now, as for the external files, if you are sending this out to, to people that don't have access to your specific web server, bundle them. You can go to the file section, upload the files, and bundle them in there. And by doing that, you take away those instructions. And, and that's what happened in the past. And one of the main reasons why plugins are great is you don't have to provide all these instructions of saying, well, you need this file here, this file there, this is the reference. You can actually embed that all directly within the plugin and so that the end Apex developer doesn't have to be too concerned about that, about all that extra configuration. And as Debbie pointed out, some people might not even have access to their web server to put it on. So this makes it really simple and easy for them to use. James? Great, thanks Martin. So we've got another question from Jose Murillo, thanks again. What would be the best approach to bring data from other data sources, so SQL, MySQL, etc., within a plugin into Apex? That's a very good question. I don't know if that's more of a data migration issue, and it depends on how you how big the files are, how you want to actually do this. And I'm saying it's a data migration issue because I go back to that, that, think about that slide where I was talking about the proof of concept. I'd ask myself, well, what's the proof of concept, how I'm going to get data from SQL server into an Oracle database? Do I have a database link? Do I have, am I doing a straight export in text files and uploading it? It all depends on what you're going to do get it working in a proof of concept, whether that's through PL SQL, or it's probably going to assume PL SQL, and if you have any JavaScript or HTML, whatever you need, but once you have that proof of concept and you can get it working with Oracle, then you can go and implement it into a plugin. But until you get it working in your PL SQL, the plugin's really an irrelevant point, or irrelevant part of the picture at that point. Thanks, Martin. I also thought that was a very interesting question. Okay, so we're going to wrap things up there. Uh, again, you have Martin's contact details. To get in contact with myself, please visit allthingsoracle.com, uh, and you can you can email me from from that site. Uh, uh, I'll just pass over to Martin to, to say the final goodbye. But thank you again for, for joining us today. And thanks a lot, James, and I have to thank Redgate and allthingsoracle.com for sponsoring this webinar. And thanks again for your time. I hope you got to enjoy the presentation.